Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whitlaw. Now, before I introduce my guest today, just a gentle reminder to uh, do subscribe, won't you, to the channel. Uh, we're going great guns at the moment, but we're never complacent. So just please go to the subscribe button and subscribe, it's free. And then next door there's the notifications, a little bell, and then you will get notifications of when all our programs come up. And uh, of course, as you might have noticed, there are getting to be more and more of them. Um, now, uh, I don't know about you, but I really like books that really tell you what they're about. And the one we're discussing today indeed does just that. The title is Not Zero, How an Irrational Target Will Impoverish You, Help China, and Won't Even Save the Planet. Here it is. Um, it's by Ross Clark, author and journalist. He's a columnist for The Telegraph, The Spectator, and for The Mail. Thank you very much for coming in. in Pleasure. House. Thank you. Um, obviously, we're talking about net zero. Um, first things first, because I think that this is one of those subjects where people hear a lot about it, but not, they don't even quite know what is meant by it, maybe. Um, what is the aim of net zero as a government policy? Well, the, the government sets itself a legally binding target to eliminate net zero carbon emissions, well actually net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And that means things like fossil fuel burning, um, steel making, cement making, all things which um, produce large clouds of carbon dioxide at the moment and other greenhouse gases. Um, they'll either have to be eliminated by 2050 or if there are still emissions in some of the hard to decarbonize industries, like steel, cement, then we'll have to have some kind of negative carbon emissions through um, uh, carbon capture and storage, um, that uh, emerging technology. So uh, you're talking about, what, 27 years' time? It is indeed. Not even 30 years', years time. Um, you mentioned there that this is a, a legally binding commitment, i.e. it's not just an aspiration. Um, how did this actually get to be passed into law? Well, it was sort of snuck through the um, House of Commons in the dying days of Theresa May's government in um, 2019, um, without even a vote. They had about 90 minutes of debate. And um, it, it has committed us, so, you know, just about the biggest change in um, far-reaching piece of legislation in modern times, and yet without even a parliamentary debate, proper vote or um, or anything else. So it was sort of really just sort of got past actually, it just it, it just almost without people noticing. It was nodded through as a sort of amendment to the 2008 Climate Change Act which um, uh, committed us to um, reducing carbon emissions by 80% on right. 1990 levels by 2050. So it was, you know, it was put through as an amendment to that. Um, to go the whole way and eliminate all net carbon emissions. Yes, yeah. but um, why was it that Britain, along with a few other countries, very few other countries, made this legal commitment? What, what was, why? What, what was the motive for that? Because I mean, other countries have just sort of said, we will try. Mm -hmm. Well, in, indeed, I mean, obviously the ultimate aim is to try and stop climate change or stop the earth warming. I mean, mm. there is a link between amount of carbon dioxide in the air and the global temperature. Yeah. Um, but, um, and 2050 was sort of pretty well plucked out of the uh, air as a target. Um, Britain thought, well, if we were the first uh, country to, to do it, we'll, we'll pave the way and others will be inspired to do the same. But that's not happened. There's um, a few other countries that most of Europe, Canada, New Zealand, Chile have come put themselves under legally binding targets to, to get to net zero. They Between them they account for about 10% of global emissions. Mm. Um, but the real big emitters, China, US, um, no interest in legally <laughs> binding themselves this way. China's um, so announced an aspiration to eliminate carbon emissions by 2060. Um, the US has said we'll try and halve them by um, 2050, uh, 2030, sorry. 
Um, but you know, there's no, you know, they're not, it's not going to put themselves under straitjacket. They made it quite clear they're not going to harm their economic growth by doing this. In fact, you know what Joe Biden has done instead of a net zero target, he's come up with what he calls an Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a, a bit of protectionism in disguise. Puts mm. lots of uh, um, subsidies for uh, U.S. motorists who buy American-made cars and so on, but um, uh, you know, quite likely going to suck industry out of Europe, and uh, you know, there's a big hoo-ha over that at the moment. And uh, India as well. It said by 2060, is it? it 2070 is India's target. But again, it's just an aspiration. Mm. And India is a fast-growing economy. It, it wants energy, it's en very energy hungry, it's not going to constrain itself in the way we have by mm. um, placing itself mm. in a straitjacket. Now, what, uh, basically, uh, we account for 2%, don't we, of carbon emissions? 1%. 1%. And yet China, 33%, is that right? Ch China's about 33%, yeah. It is quite extraordinary. What is the, because I've read a new quote in your book, different estimates. What is it estimated this is going to cost? Well, w when this was put through the House of Commons in 2019, MPs were sort of relying on an estimate that had been published by the government's Climate Change Committee, which claimed it was going to cost one trillion pound to uh, um, reach net zero by 2050. And MPs thought, well, that doesn't sound too much. We'll, we'll vote for it. Or we won't vote for it. We'll nod it through, rather. Um, but um, <laughs> the government, the government kept being to press to well, come up with an estimate, your own estimate for what this is going to cost. Tell us. Mm. Um, and in 2021, the Treasury announced, "Well, sorry, we can't come up with an estimate because we've got no idea of how we're going to get to net zero. So we have no idea what it's going to mm. cost." Mm. And yet, so you know, it's a legal commitment. I mean, if you're going to legally commit yourself to do anything well surely the first thing you should do is decide how you're going to do it and yeah. uh, have a realistic target not just one that's um pie in the sky also of course it, it depends doesn't it on technology which is not even in existence yet well indeed um to, to get to net anywhere near net zero it's mm. not just a case of building a few wind farms there are things like what are called process emissions in steel and cement making where the chemical process itself um, farming fertilizer manufacture there are just so many different technologies w which have to be mastered mm. um, net zero has been compared by some to the sort of promise J john f kennedy made in 1961 in saying we'll put a man on the moon yes. by the end of the 60s yeah. which of course america did but um, you know that was one um, very straightforward, well, straightforward to achieve, but um, one distinct um, ambition to put a man on the moon. Whereas what we've done is we, we've put ourselves um, under obligation to de develop multiple new technologies, mm. all of which have to be commercially you know become commercially viable within the next 27 years and it is just a huge um you know millstone around our neck well it's going to completely change the whole way in which we live isn't it if it, if it happens i mean what what are the kind of privations apart from what will end up being three or four trillion won't it what are the privations that basically people are going to have to face well, look, look at you look at the America uh, the government estimates of um, things we do know how to do, like build high-speed railways, mm. and what the budget of HS2 yeah. has done. But there, there seem to be two different schools on on net zero. There's the sort of hair shirt school, if you like, who say, you know, we've all got to constrain our lifestyles. We've got to consume less. There's even a movement called the degrowth movement, which mm. wants to shrink mm. actively wants to shrink the economy. But then on the other hand, you've got the um, Conservative government, which says, no, we, we don't have to um, compromise our lifestyles. Um, technology will ride to the rescue. Yeah. And I think both of those positions are completely um, you know, off their trolley because um, firstly, people globally are not going to agree to become poorer. Mm -hmm. You know, for people and few people in Islington might think that's a good idea, but 
uh, you know, the world's poor are not going to accept being made even mm. poorer. Um, but as for the idea technology is going to save us, all I say is, you know, if we'd been having this discussion 70 years ago, um, we'd have been saying, well, nuclear fusion is going to ride to the rescue. There was an infamous quote by the chairman of the US Nuclear Authority in 1954, who said it's not too much to expect that our children will benefit from electricity which is too cheap to meet her. Mm. Well, that didn't quite come off, did it? So, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, you know, net zero is a similar sort of, um, uh, you know, hostage to fortune as that was. But I mean, it, the point with the whole climate change issue is how many times have we been told certain things are going to happen, you know, and people give us, don't they? Time timelines, <clears throat> and here we still are, um, and Armageddon hasn't sort of risen. I wonder, do you want to make clear what your position is generally on the subject, Ross? I mean, you know, you wouldn't say that you are uh, anti um, the climate change movement, particularly, would you? Or is this entirely about just net zero, or or what? Yeah, I mean, firstly, on climate change itself, yeah, I accept that there is a you know, clear trend in upwards temperatures from about 1980 and a longer term trend from the 19th century. That's, um, you know, that is confirmed by mm. multiple different data sources. Um, and there's almost certainly a lot of that is to do with man-made carbon emissions. We can't prove it, but it most likely is. Um, I don't disagree with the general direction of policy towards clean energy, um, reducing, eventually possibly trying to eliminate carbon emissions. But what I really, the problem for me is this hard fixed target by mm. 2050, which, you know, as I say, is going to cause all kinds of problems because I just cannot see how anybody could possibly be confident that we could get there without completely damaging mm. the economy mm. and impoverishing ourselves. Mm. And there does appear I mean, uh, to be the most extraordinary hysteria, it seems to me, around this topic. I mean, w w what do you think is behind that? A sort of groupthink, a total groupthink. I mean, this isn't just British Conservative Party. I mean, all parties are signed up to this, aren't they, in Britain? It's, ve parties? it's very easy to frighten people, as we found out yeah. during COVID. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's bizarre the way this hysteria ha has got hold because, you know, I read the IPCC report, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a huge sort of compendium of research on climate. Um, I read the British State of the Climate report, and I simply cannot recognise from those reports the, the, the stuff that we get mm. in the press and BBC broadcast and so on saying yeah. that there's an existential threat to mankind and where billions of people are going to die and so on. And there's some things which are just factually wrong. Mm. Um, you know, we're told endlessly that we're going to face more storms as a result of climate change. Well, I mean, if you actually look at the data, it points to a downward trend in uh, storminess and extreme wind speeds in Britain up to about, you know, the latitude of the Shetland Islands. Um, mm. <laughs> you know, I think well, how does it become turned on its head and um, suddenly become? And of course, you know, if you actually try and point these things out in 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 the in the press, it's extremely difficult to uh, get a berth on the BBC or or mm. in many mm. places to actually point this out. And yes. um, it's bizarre the way one version has sort of become almost legislated for. But, but why? Why is there this? You say it's bizarre, but what do you put it down to? I think the climate activists, environment activists, have actually been very, very clever on this. Mm. And um, you know, whenever you know somebody like me appears in the writes anything, appears on the TV, radio, or something, you know, there's a whole b army of environmental bloggers who will sort of nitpick and try mm. and. Um, pick out things, you know, which aren't quite 100 percent accurate. So, mm. well, I, you know, I, I don't mind them. Welcome. Great. You know, because they force me to up my game. But 
um, there's nobody doing it from the other side. No, and, um, no. you know, I listened to the Today programme and um, they sort of interview someone from Extinction Rebellion who says millions of people are going to die. And I said, <laughs> where does that come from? Mm. And nobody's sort of picking them up about it, mm. that it's not being challenged. And so the whole debate is being skewed I I in, in one direction. In fact, you point out in the book, there's a set of uh, statistics are quite interesting. Um, you know people, as you say, they talk about storms getting worse, natural disasters, all of this sort of thing. Every time it happens, in fact, you start the book with an anecdote about being on a train going up to COP27 or whatever it was, and Jon Snow immediately, when the train was stopped by a, a tree on the track, yes. he immediately saw this as some kind of metaphor. Uh, well, you know, this is my God, you know, this is, it, this is what we're going to face and everything. But when you look at these statistics, um, the number of people who've died from natural disasters has just, well, it's sort of collapsed. It's, it, 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 it's hugely done, like 500,000 people 100 years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. right down to, what, 50,000 or something now? Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's obviously not to do with the climate so much, no. it's to do with our ability to um, cope with natural disasters. But, you know, for that very reason, you don't want to um, interfere with economic growth mm. because rich countries can um, withstand natural disasters, poor countries can't. And I often took up the two examples of Netherlands and Bangladesh, both um, very vulnerable um, geographies on deltas, prone to um, North Sea surges in um, Netherlands case and monsoon in Bangladesh's case, very difficult places to live. But, you know, one suffers multiple floods and the other doesn't. And what is the difference? It's the Netherlands is rich. It's um, learnt how to defend its coast, to mm. build um, sea walls and redirect rivers and to warn its population when there's bad weather coming. Now, Bangladesh is picking up on that sort of thing and they've, they've made a lot of progress actually in coping with floods, but you know, they're still a long, long way around, mm. behind. But you know, for that reason, you absolutely want them to grow their economy mm. so they become more resilient and uh, and so on. Yes, um, I wonder, you know, that there is surely a political motive as well behind lo a lot of this in the sense that uh, you mentioned at the beginning there about people who want to shrink the economy, you know, anti-growth people. Could you not say that that could be described as anti-capitalist people? You know, I mean, to me, in my experience of them, and I've had some experience, um, they were far to the left of, of like Labour, for example. Yeah. I yes, think they used yeah, to call them yeah. watermelons, remember? Yes, red on green. the inside. Yeah. <laughs> green on the outside, red on the inside, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. For, for some people, a lot of people are very powerful on the left. Um, climate change is a vehicle by which to attack um, capitalism. Mm. And you see, you remember those anti-capitalist protests mm. in um, the early 2000s and they'd go and put, a, you know, Ray William um, Winston Churchill's statue and smashed Starbucks windows and so on. Yeah. And they never gained much traction mm. until that was, that is, that they attached themselves to climate change and suddenly it became an environmental movement. And at that point, they sucked in a lot more support from sort of uh, well-meaning middle class people who are obviously concerned about the environment because we all are. But, you know, suddenly find themselves sort of almost backing this extreme left wing agenda, which, you know, Extinction Rebellion, mm. you look at their origins and they actually came out of a, a very, you know, left wing Marxist mm. organisation, which, you know, was their to um, smash capitalism and yes, suddenly yeah. rebranded themselves, if you like, as a climate change. Uh, well, it's interesting, business. you know, uh, uh, because Greta, Saint Greta Thunberg uh, has, you know, she's come out recently saying that, well, you know, it's about capitalism and it's about racism, it's about all of these things, you know. Um, I, mean, I noticed, by the way, she, she's got one mention in your book, Greta Thunberg. Is that intentional? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I didn't set out to write a book about Greta no. Thunberg. I mean, I, my thoughts on Greta Thunberg, I mean, I mean, I quite like her. I think it's quite fun, isn't she, to have a sort of um, 
a teenager, well, not necessarily a teenager now, but um, going round, sort of leading round these sort of politicians by the nose. Mm. He's almost got them on the sort of, a, yeah. a, you know, like a pig on a string almost. She's managed to lead them around. But, um, and sometimes she says things which are, are true as well. I mean, she, you know, there's a point that I make in the book. I've been making the book since she was knee high, but nobody ever listened to me, which was that the, um, the trouble with the way that carbon emissions are um, defined, which is just territorial yes. emissions. You know, carbon emissions physically spewed out in Britain and the government said we reduce them by 50%. And mostly that's, uh, partly that's due to replacing coal with gas, power stations, but partly it's because we've exported our heavy industry. Mm. We've mm. exported our carbon yeah. emissions yeah. with it. And the trouble with this net zero target, of course, is it gives the government an incentive to continue that process to export industry food production and so on because it gets carbon off Britain's carbon budget doesn't do anything for the globe of course yeah. the whole world but it yeah. helps the government get closer to its own target but of course again so much of these protests uh, that you, you mentioned well you know they are aimed at well at Britain in London or whatever and, and Western countries um, Pretty much don't go near China, do they? <laughs> they don't want to dare go. You know, I mean, China they're, they're not going to go up, you know, to Tiananmen Square or whatever. Can you imagine protest. Just Stop Oil going to glue themselves to Tiananmen Square or a motorway in China? It wouldn't yeah. last five minutes, would yeah, they? They exactly. just want to bark, bark but, it up. Well, I mean, if that's the case, Ross, what would you suggest? What do you, you, do, you do put some things forward in the book. I mean, the, the first thing you say, which I think, is, but is that we've got to. One of the first things is we've got to stop panicking, right? Sure. So you know, how the hell do people stop panicking <laughs> when the media and all politicians and the royal family and all these are all signed up to this? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, I mean, we we've just got to look at the the real science rather than the sort of yeah. exaggerated science. The global temperatures are increasing by about 0.1 celsius per decade slightly heavier rainfall um you know storminess in certain places less storminess in others and london having the climate of the loire valley and so on um you know some changes and rising sea levels that's the biggest problem from mm. britain's point of view because obviously we're a, mm. got a lot of coastal margins london um is virtually at sea level um you know that that's a problem but um so you know i'm all for reducing carbon emissions um and encouraging the technologies which help get us there in a sensible way but if you're going to set yourself a legally binding target you're going to make the wrong decisions you're going to force yourself into things which are much less good than the proper solutions which you know might need a little time to to grow and so on. So, you know, what we should do about it, uh, we should encourage new technology, government should um, uh, put money into new technology, we should encourage things where the technology exists, you know, we're quite right to close down coal power stations and switch to gas. Um, wind, solar power is great, but it needs backup, it needs storage, and we're not investing in that in the minute because we don't have a viable affordable means of um, energy storage um, do those things all those things but just do not put yourself in this straight jacket of saying we've got to get there by 2050 because all we're going to do export our industry export our food production impoverish ourselves to no benefit of the planet whatsoever because other countries are not going to copy us this is the point is that it's, you, you feel that when it comes to these declarations that are made that essentially the countries yeah sure you know it's a bit like saying yes i i sign up to world peace i want world peace one day you know who's not going to say that um but they have actually no intention whatsoever of keeping to them i mean whereas we somehow as you say have locked ourselves you know down uh in the ground um you also have mentioned by the way you said there a bit about flooding um, that with coastal towns, um, isn't it correct, uh, if I remember from the book, that 
the government's have sort of written them off as not being viable mm -hmm. in the future, isn't that right? Yeah, well you'd think, you know, government keeps telling us perils of climate change and so on. You'd think it would be making a priority yeah. of the very basic things to protect us from uh, rising sea levels. And yet our coastal and river defence budget is pathetic. You mm. know, for years we were spending under a billion pounds, it's a bit more now, but for, for years we were spending under a billion pounds on all coastal defences, new defences, maintenance of existing defences. And at the same time we were spending two and a half billion pound on subsidising mm. green energy mm. and you think well that's mad priority and mm. we, we seem to with coastal defence in particular we seem to have this ideology from the green movement you shouldn't try to do anything just let cliffs erode let places mm. flood create marshland for, mm. <laughs> for mm. the wading birds and so on but you know there's people's homes there and there's a lot of property and yet you know, we have this incredibly measly attitude mm. to coastal defence, which mm. um, is extremely serious. And you, you mentioned, obviously, as I said, uh, this will help China. Um, I mean, how will it help? What, what, in what particular ways? Obviously, it's obvious, you know, they're off the hook. But there they are with, what, 33% of global emissions. Um, do you mean that they just simply won't be challenged? Well, net zero was sold to us partly by the government on the grounds that it would create all these green jobs. Um, green, you know, jobs in new green industries, renewable industry and so on. Um, well, those jobs have been created, mm. but not in Britain. Mm. They've been created in China. And the ONS keeps an eye on, the Office of National Statistics keeps an eye on the green economy. And it says that the green economy has not expanded in Britain in the past decade, just the same size it was in 2013. Meanwhile, you know, our wind turbines, solar panels and so on, they're all being made in China. And why? Because energy price is a lot cheaper in China, all costs are cheaper mm. in China. Mm. And we're actually sort of driving, rather than creating a green economy here, we're, we're driving industry abroad because mm. um you know we're piling costs on our industry which just are not imposed in mm. india and china and so on mm. well i mean what do you think the chances are of actually you know british policy changing i mean there's no one in the political sphere for example saying we've really got to look at this law you know we we you know they, they, no one is said they're all signed up what are the chances of it actually changing in the short term very little because as you say everyone's um signed up everybody thinks it's so virtuous uh, that they won't um kick against it but as the closer we get to 2050 mm. the more obvious it's going to come become how expensive it's going to become, how difficult it's going to become, how it's going to make life inconvenient for mm. a lot of people, and particularly how it's going to um, impact on people on low incomes who you know, face the biggest rises in costs. And as we get to 2050, the, you know, there's almost certainly going to be a watering down of that target. Yes. Yeah. Um, my fear is, you know, one of three things is going to happen. Firstly, you know, miracle technology on multiple fronts and we get to net zero, great, probably not going to happen. But um, secondly, um, the government waters down the target, revises it, says we'll do it by 2060 or we won't commit ourselves to it. I think that's probably going to happen in the longer run. But the, the outcome I really fear is the government tries to fudge it as it's doing now by exporting our industry, exporting mm. food production, our jobs with it, piling costs on the poor, um, you know, and all kinds of um, perverse outcomes in order to try to desperately reach this target. And that could leave us very, very poorly off. Well, Ross, well, so I think uh, this is a, you know, a, a salutary 270 page warning. Um, you know, I would suggest that you read it. Um, not zero, how an irrational target will impoverish you, help China and won't 
even save the planet. This is available on Amazon and, of course, in all good bookshops. Indeed. Again. All good bookshops. Um, we have a few further questions for you for our members, if you just stay uh, sure. with us for a while. Thank you, Ross. But in the meantime, thank you very, very much thank uh, you. for coming and talking about this. Um, there you go. You've been warned. So um, we shall see you next week on So What You're Saying Is. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free, just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.